I'm going to be short because everybody is waiting for you. So on behalf of the Department of English and Comparative Literature and the American University in Cairo, AUC, I, Feriel Ghazoul, welcome Professor Chomsky for the 17th Edward Said Memorial Lecture. Edward Said was a frequent visitor to Egypt and was invited to lecture as a distinguished university professor several times at AUC. Lectures in the series, most of the lecturers in the series knew Said personally as Professor Chomsky did. Thanks to Maryam Said, the announcement for today's webinar has a photo of Noam Chomsky and Edward Said happily chatting with each other. The speakers who have delivered the Said Memorial Lectures in the past include David Damrosh, Barbara Harlow, Cornel West, Terry Eagleton, Rockis de Groot, Judith Butler, John Carlos Rowe, Michael Wood, Sari Magdesi, Marina Warner, Lila Abulod, Suleiman Bashir Diem, Osama Magdesi, Robert Young, Wadiya Said, and Raja Shahadi. Professor Chomsky needs no introduction. He is a global public intellectual and a linguist who has revolutionized the field of language and grammar studies. Rather than go over his dozens of books, awards and honors, I will concentrate on his relation to AUC. Professor Chomsky was invited by our colleague Nelly Hanna in 1993, and he delivered three lectures that were published the following year by AUC Press, entitled World Orders New, Old and New, World Orders Old and New. The book was translated to Arabic by Atif Abdel Hamid and published uh, by Al Nahda Press in the year 2007. The presence of Professor Chomsky in Cairo was an event. Hundreds of students and faculty attended and were inspired. Professor Chomsky lectured again at AUC in 2012 at the downtown campus. Worried about likely mob scene of hundreds of students from AUC and the state universities converging to hear the iconic radical intellectual, a queue line was arranged for the patiently awaiting attendees then that ran from AUC gate of Mohammed Mahmoud Street to Tahrir Square, about one kilometers. Loudspeakers were used in the AUC courtyard to reach those who could not get place in Ewood Hall with its 1,000 plus seats. Professor Chomsky's lecture today addresses a timely concern. Its title is Global Realignments and the Prospects for a Livable World. Professor Chomsky, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I should say that I'm delighted to be with you again at AUC, very sorry, it's not in person, but that was impossible. And doubly delighted to have the honor to be delivering a lecture in, uh, in memory of my close friend, Edward Said. I've already had the privilege of doing so in Beirut, in Australia, in the United States. There's no more appropriate place than here. I'd like to begin with a, a 
deeply troubling question, which may seem remote from our immediate concern about the prospects for a livable world, but in fact is not remote. It casts a shadow over all of these concerns. In one form, the question was raised by the astrophysicist Enrico Fermi 70 years ago. Put very simply, the question is, where are they? Fermi recognized that within the accessible universe, planets that should be able to sustain intelligent life, life that is advanced enough to have contacted Earth, but no trace of them had been found. It's called Fermi's paradox. It's now 70 years later, there has been total failure of very extensive efforts to find some indication of their existence, of the existence of intelligent life, the paradox has been greatly deepened. Various answers to the paradox have been proposed. One story has it that uh, famous mathematician physicist John von Neumann responded at once to Fermi by saying that any advanced civilization would have developed nuclear energy and then destroyed itself by uncontrolled radiation. Something to think about. Another idea is that an inherent property of higher intelligence is a gap between the technological capacity to destroy and the moral capacity to control that impulse, a gap that is unbridgeable. The existence of the gap in our case is all too evident. We are now actually engaged in an experiment to test the thesis that it is unbridgeable. If we give the wrong answer, we are doomed. Perhaps not tomorrow, though that's not excluded, but in the not too distant future. And in that case, the decline from irreversible tipping points, which we are already reaching, the decline from these will be so grim that few would want even to endure the experience. I am, of course, referring to the two primary threats to the survival of organized human life on Earth, not to speak of the many other species that we are wantonly destroying in our madness. Two threats are, of course, nuclear war and global warming. Current commentary has descended in quality so low that it is now treating nuclear war as an option to be considered. And policies are being pursued that make it more likely. I'll return to that, only noting now that the word madness that I used is wholly inadequate. I don't know of a proper one. Let's keep for the moment to heating the environment to a level where the outcome is almost unimaginable and to how we're dealing with that prospect. That's the gap. Let's start right here in the Eastern Mediterranean. Recent scientific studies the last few weeks have found that earlier estimates of the effects of global heating on the Eastern Mediterranean were seriously flawed. They badly underestimated the impact 
in one of the regions of the world that will most be most intensively infected. The new research shows that on our present course, by the end of the century, average temperatures will have risen five degrees Celsius and the sea level will be two to two and a half meters higher than today. You can contemplate that. I leave it to your imagination. The next question is, how are the potential victims reacting to these very clear warnings from their own top scientists and from the international scientific community? Answer by ignoring them. Worse still, the victims are competing to see who will have the honor of administering the coup de grace. That's the precise meaning of the recent Israel-Lebanon negotiations and agreements over who will have the right to exploit the fossil fuel reserves at their maritime border. The negotiations were successful and this successful outcome was hailed with enthusiasm and by international commentary, all delighted at this latest illustration of our dedication to self-destruction. Short distance away, a conflict is brewing in Not much discussion, but it might explode into a major war. It's serious. In the background, are concerns about who will lead the way to destroy the environment that sustains life by exploiting the fossil fuel resources of the Eastern Mediterranean and supervising new pipelines to accelerate the disaster. And of course, the petrostates of the region luxuriate in vast riches by poisoning the atmosphere. Saudi Arabia, the leader in this race to destruction, Saudi Arabia just reported a phenomenal $42 billion in profit for the last quarter. That's twice the record profits for ExxonMobil. It also announced Saudi Arabia that it's increasing its production facilities, those facilities that must decline if we are to survive and decline soon. Well, let's move a little farther away. South Asia, India and Pakistan are devoting scarce resources to prepare for a likely war that will destroy both of them. It will also have lethal consequences beyond, that's an unavoidable consequence of nuclear war between major powers. One major source of likely conflict is the melting of the glacier, glaciers in the Himalayas that serve as major water resources for both of them. While they're engaged in these efforts, a third of Pakistan has been under several meters of water from unprecedented monsoon rains. Nearby in North India, poor peasants living in huts, of course without air conditioning, seek to survive temperatures that are reaching 50 degrees Celsius. And of course, this is not the ceiling. It's only the current stage of air folly. A few days ago, the World Meteorological Organization released a study of the trajectory that we are now pursuing. The study 
reported, unsurprisingly, that last year's greenhouse gas levels hit new highs. It also looked back. It reported, I'm quoting it now, that between 1990 and 2021, the warming effect on our climate by long-lived greenhouse gases rose by nearly 50%, that's since 1990, with carbon dioxide accounting for about 80% of this increase. Well, you can work it out for yourselves. The anticipated trajectory is quite clear. There is also some good news. The International Energy Association a few days ago reaffirmed its message that the means to prevent the catastrophe and to move on to a better world are available and feasible if we can close the grim gap in time. And options are available. In Egypt, for example, Egypt could be supplying the bulk of, it, of Europe's energy needs with solar power. Promising projects have been developed on a small scale, but they're not being pursued. It's evidently considered more exciting to build megacities in the desert and prisons for the tens of thousands of political prisoners who are wasting away. People like the writer, philosopher, Allah Abdel Fattah, now at risk of death from a six month hunger strike against cruel and unjust imprisonment. One of many, that's the choice to how to use resources. The world, Meteorological Organization report that I mentioned began with 1990. The reason was that that's when the countries of the world were preparing to meet in Kyoto to establish the first international treaty to control the plague that led to the Kyoto Protocol. It was signed by all states, almost two states. Andorra and the United States, though Canada, which is always Washington's shadow, has since withdrawn to join these two offenders. Well, 1990 is significant in another respect. That's when the basic information about the dread consequences of global heating reached beyond the scientific world to the general public. The critical event was the widely publicized testimony on the coming catastrophe by the prominent climate scientist, uh, James Hansen. The corporate sector reacted at once in fact, scientists in the fossil fuel industries had been in the forefront in identifying and warning about but their work and warnings had been filed away as annoying after Hansen's testimony in 1988, secrecy was no longer possible. The public relations specialists of the companies were called into action. They recommended that the companies should not deny the facts, which would lead to their being quickly refuted. Rather, they suggested the companies should sow doubts. Maybe we have not yet understood the effect of sunspots or maybe cloud cover, maybe something else. Let's be reasonable and wait. Meanwhile, we'll be growing our economies by 
rapid use of fossil fuels so that later we'll be able to confront the problems if there is a much richer society. Meanwhile, we'll be raking in huge profits, and that's implicit but not mentioned. That worked very well. The consequences are those reviewed by the World Meteorological Organization. Well, that episode illuminates another respect in which higher intelligence operates to render the gap unbridgeable, the gap between capacity to destroy and to control the impulse. Over the centuries, we've created, we've constructed structures which are dedicated to species suicide in the interest of short-term gain for the masters. That's not a new insight. 250 years ago, Adam Smith in his classic work observed that those he called the masters of mankind, in his day that was the merchants, manufacturers of England, the masters he wrote are the principal architects of government policy. They make sure that their own interests are most peculiarly attended to, no matter how grievous the effect on others, including the people of England, though more so the victim of the savage injustice of the Europeans abroad. In all ages, Smith warned, if operating without public constraint, the masters will relentlessly pursue their vile maxim, all for ourselves, nothing for anyone else. Smith's focus on the savage injustice was on crimes in India, which were then in their early stages, accelerated greatly beyond. In the years that followed, with a legacy that remained not alone in these enterprises. There is current testimony the bodies of thousands drowning in the Mediterranean today, mostly seeking to escape with Mexico, where miserable refugees are dying in the harsh desert. They're fleeing from the terrible life you criminals. As for the border, there's nothing natural about it. It was established by Am I back? Okay. Can you? Sue it also. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me, uh, Professor Chomsky? This is the difficulty of. Thank you very much. I just okay. want to, say, to ask I you. This is not unique to the internet. I've had early experiences. Yeah. One interesting one was when I was giving memorial lectures for Bertrand Russell at his college, Trinity College in Cambridge, England. In the middle of the lecture, somebody came up to me and asked me to leave the stage. The auditorium was being evacuated because of bombing threats. 
This is tame by comparison, just internet failure. Well, let me return. I was discussing the savage injustice of the Europeans, one of its current manifestations, the European efforts to make sure that people trying to flee from their the wreckage they left behind in the course of their savage injustice, that the miserable refugees die in the Mediterranean, if they can even get that far, right where I live, not far from the Mexican border, pretty much the same. People fleeing from the countries devastated by US terror in Central America. The border itself is artificial, like most borders, it was established by violent aggression, stole half of Mexico, Southwest, West United States. That's when Britain's offshoot in the Americas was taking over the task of savage injustice from the Europeans, task it's performed admirably since. And so it continues. Let's go back to the trajectory outlined by the World Meteorological Organization. The trajectory continues. The United States is opening up vast new fields for exploration for oil, along with others, it's opening huge numbers of new miles of new pipelines. The euphoria in the fossil fuel industry headquarters is unconstrained. It's buoyed not only by the stellar prospects for the march to the precipice, but also by profits beyond the dreams of avarice. Last week, Exxon, Exxon Mobil posted the highest profit in its 152 year history as natural gas demand and prices surged. Second largest company, Chevron, also blew past Emerson estimates to post their second highest profit effort, net income at over $11 billion for the quarter. Others follow suit, and they're laggards by Middle East standards. Well, their partners among the masters are not lagging behind. Military production is skyrocketing along with profits. The few mega corporations that dominate food production are reporting record breaking profits thanks to the hunger that's stalking the world. Pursuit of the vile maxim is relentless and there are major impacts everywhere. As you know, there's an election coming in the United States in a few days. It will probably empower the far right as it just did yesterday in Israel, the religious right. The major reason is concern over inflation. About 40% of the recent inflation in the United States can be attributed to fatter corporate profit margins, but those are untouchable in the political system dominated by the masters. They're also unmentionable in the information system that they largely control. Those are the institutions we have created highly instructive to look closely at details. Individual cases, however slight, yield a good deal of insight into the vile maxim and the institutional imperatives that lie behind it. All of this must be understood and brought under control, if not ended, if there's to be any hope of closing the grim gap. So I'll just take a quick look. US government just passed a climate bill. It's a pale shadow 
of what had been proposed by the Biden administration under the impact of popular climate activism. Step by step, it was cut back. Republicans who are set to win the coming election are 100% opposed to anything that might pursue, that might impede pursuit of the vile maxim by their ultra rich and corporate backers. And a few right wing Democrats joined them. In the end, the popular organizations dedicated to preserving viable life on earth could not compete with the power of the true masters in the corporate sector. Well, the final shadow that survived is not meaningless. It is, however, radically insufficient in its reach, and it's also burdened with measures to ensure that the interests of the masters are most peculiarly attended to, to borrow Adam Smith's words. The bill that the masters were willing to accept includes vast government subsidies that are already driving forward large oil and gas projects that threaten a heavy carbon footprint with companies, including ExxonMobil and others, positioned for big payouts. That's quotes. I'm quoting the Washington Post, one of the two national journals. One of the devices that was established to satisfy the needs of the masters, I'm continuing to quote, one of the devices is a vast wad of money for carbon capture. I had my own comments. The proper translation of the phrase carbon capture is, let's keep poisoning the atmosphere freely and maybe someday somebody will figure out a way to remove some of the poisons. Actually, that's too kind. It's much worse. I'll continue to quote the Washington Post story, quoting, the irony of carbon capture is that the place it has proven most successful is getting more oil out of the ground. All but one of the major projects built in the United States is geared toward fossil fuel companies taking the trapped carbon and injecting it into underground wells to extract crude oil. These are our institutional structures. There's more to say about that, but I'll go on. These are one product of higher intelligence. They take diverse forms, but all within the general state capitalist framework that's prevailed everywhere for the past century. There has been progress in constraining their worst excesses. And in the past 40 years, serious regression. We have some measures of the success of the savage class war that's misleadingly called neoliberalism. In the United States, of course, the leader in the pack by virtue of its enormous power. In the United States, $50 trillion has been transferred from the general population to the pockets of the top 1% during the 40 years since Reagan opened the door to unconstrained class war. That's pretty impressive highway robbery. In the traditional domains of savage European injustice, it's been even worse. The structural adjustment programs that were a core part of the neoliberal package imposed two decades of stagnation on Latin America. They tore up the social, social order elsewhere. 
notably in the former Yugoslavia and in Rwanda, where the breakdown of social order laid the groundwork for the terrible crimes that ensued. Well, can this be reversed? In principle, yes, we know how, just as we know how the climate crisis can be contained by readily available measures that will make it possible to move on to a much better world. The grim question remains, is the gap unbridgeable between what we know how to do and our capacity to implement that knowledge for the common good? Well, with that in mind, let's turn to the second of the threats to survival. This one is imminent. It's not lingering in mounting horror like the climate crisis. Second threat is nuclear war. With, with regard to nuclear war, that the grim question of the unbridgeable gap was posed in stark terms. 80 years ago, almost 80 years ago, August 1945, the day of the first use of nuclear weapons. That made it very clear that human technical competence had risen or perhaps descended to the level where it could destroy life on Earth. Not quite. The bombs were still too small. But it was clear then that technology would move on to the capacity to destroy everything. And it did. In 1952, when the US and the USSR exploded thermonuclear weapons. At that point, the hands of the famous doomsday clock were advanced to two minutes to midnight. Midnight meaning termination of the human experiment. The hands have oscillated since, varying with assessments of the global security situation. They did not reach two minutes again until President Trump's term in office. In his last year, the analysts abandoned minutes. They moved to seconds, 100 seconds to midnight where the hands now stand. They'll be reset in a few months, and I suspect they'll be moved still closer to midnight. They certainly should be. The nature of the threat of mutual destruction is stated very clearly in the official strategic posture of the United States. Under Trump, it was shifted from focus on terrorism to what was called peer competition, the need to prevail in two nuclear wars with China and this, remember, was 2018, well before the invasion of Ukraine. Well, that might seem to be a definition of clinical insanity, a war with either of the two would be the end. We have since moved beyond. The Biden administration adopted the policy, but expanded. official policy now is, quoting the official words, to encircle China with a ring of sentinel states. Heavily armed with precision weapons aimed at China, backed with major naval maneuvers in the Pacific, aimed at China, and insistence on transit of US naval vessels in the exclusive economic zones that are granted to China by the law of the sea, which the United States alone has not ratified among our U.S. justification of this is defense of the right of free passage, which actually has not been threatened in the least. There's what's at stake is a technical dispute about an unclear phrase in the law of the sea, 
the US claims it permits military vessels to pass through the zones. China disagrees. It's backed by India and Indonesia. The most crucial issue is Taiwan. There is an official policy it was set in the 1970s, declares Taiwan to be part of China with what is called strategic ambiguity. Neither China nor the United States will disrupt this arrangement by force. The agreement has kept the peace for 50 years, not a bad record in international affairs. Uh, there was a party Congress just recently in China. Policy was reaffirmed. President Xi declared the matter moot until 2049. That's the anniversary of Chinese independence. So, neither side is blameless, but it's Washington that has recently been taking steps to undermine the fragile agreement. The enhanced encirclement policy is one example. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's reckless visit to Taiwan is another. China did react, responded by demonstrating its capacity to blockade Taiwan. The Senate Foreign Relations Committee then passed a bipartisan Taiwan Policy Act that declares Taiwan to be a non-NATO ally of the United States, calls for Taiwan to have the same diplomatic status as any other country, along with an enhanced flow of US arms and integration with US forces, with interoperability of weapons. Biden then moved even further with a virtual declaration of war a couple of days ago. I'll quote the world's leading business journal, the London Financial Times. Here's what they say about it. Joe Biden launched a full-blown economic war on China, all but committing the US to stopping China's rise. History is likely to record Biden's move as the moment when US-China rivalry came out of the closet. America is now pledged to do everything short of fighting an actual war to stop China's rise. The US is now committed to blocking China in all kinds of civilian technologies that make up a modern economy. The New York Times declared their support for these policies. Their words, I'll quote, they described it as a new policy of actively strangling large segments of the Chinese technology industry, strangling with an intent to kill the regulations apply to any company in the world that uses American semiconductor technology. So if an American chip manufacturer agrees to make Chinese design chips could lose access to the American chip making market that it can't get anywhere else. Uh, the U.S. is seeking to ensure that China has no access to the advanced components necessary to run a modern economy. And like U.S. sanctions, all must adopt these U.S. decrees, whether they like them or not, for fear of severe retribution. Whatever one thinks of this wide range of strategic and economic policies, there's no doubt that they enhance the prospects 
of moving the hands of the doomsday clock closer to midnight. A couple of days ago, the Biden administration announced a new nuclear policy, which the arms control agency calls a significant expansion of the original mission of these weapons, which was deterring existential threats against the United States. Well, the significant expansion is spelled out by Admiral Charles Richard. He's the head of the US Strategic Command, STRATCOM, charge of nuclear weapons. Under this new policy, nuclear weapons provide what Richard calls the maneuver space necessary for the United States to project conventional military power strategically. Nuclear power is therefore a course for conventional military operations around the globe, deterring others from interfering. Nuclear weapons deter all countries all the time from interfering with US actions. It's quoting Admiral Richard again. Well, the press described all of this as not much of a change. Uh, they are right, but for reasons of which they are no doubt unaware. Uh, Stratcom Commander Richard surely could inform them that this has been US policy since 1995, since Clinton. It was elaborated then in a Stratcom document on post-Cold War deterrence. With Clinton policy, the US declared its right of first strike against non-nuclear states. Nuclear weapons must be available always because they cast a shadow over conventional use of force, deterring others from interfering. Dan Ellsberg described it, nuclear weapons are constantly used, just as a gun is used in a robbery, even if it's not fired. So it's correct that the new doctrine is not very new, though Americans are unaware of the facts, not because of censorship. The documents have been public for decades, quoted in critical literature, Sure, that receives little notice. I have not even mentioned the rising threat of nuclear war in Europe, arising from Russia's criminal aggression in Ukraine. It's much more extensively discussed, although not with sufficient urgency. The longer the war continues, the longer diplomacy is avoided, the greater the threat which is real and severe, that brings us back to the grim question and the obstacles to giving the answer that we must, if it is not to be the final question raised in the brief sojourn of humans on the earth. Can we bridge the yawning gap between technical capacity to destroy and the moral intelligence required to control this impulse. I leave that to you to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chomsky. Uh, uh, if your time allows, we have questions from three constituencies of AUC, our administrative leadership, our faculty, and our students who are requesting your insight on their inquiries. I'll be reading the questions Sorry. which were put to Sorry. Professor Chomsky one by one. One, 
On behalf of AUC leading administration, Dr. Ahmad Dallal, AUC president, an engineer and a historian of Islamic sciences, concerned about climate change, asked the following. After expressing his warm greeting and solidarity with Professor Chomsky, this is his question. Developing countries are much more vulnerable than developed nations to the effects of climate change for lacking the technical tools and financial capacities to adapt. Environmental degradation is also intensifying some of the most serious problems facing many developing countries, including food insecurity and inadequate health care. And yet, poor countries are asked to reduce their dependence on fossil fuels in what some argue would compromise their economic growth and ability to address problems of poverty and development. Who should bear the moral and economic burden of mitigating the effects of climate change? Well, I think the answer to that is implicit in the question. Of course, it should be the rich countries, not just because they have the technical capacity uh, when it seemed to have disappeared, uh, not just because they have the technical capacity, but because they're the ones responsible for the destruction. The poor countries have the so-called developing countries, a euphemism. Uh, they have not they have contributed virtually nothing to the crisis. The crisis was created by the rich countries. To be more precise, it's been created by the rich in the rich countries and the much fewer rich in the poor countries. So it's the rich in the rich countries that have created the crisis and it's the poor in the poor countries who are the victims of it. So take Pakistan, which I mentioned with a horrible story of the last couple of months that you're familiar with. Pakistan contributed almost nothing to the climate crisis. They're the ones who are being destroyed. So there's a double reason why the rich and the rich countries should be uh, bearing the burden of dealing with it. There's actually a third reason, which goes right to the nature of the gap. If the rich in the rich countries don't help the poor in the poor countries to move to sustainable energy, the rich will be destroyed. Climate change doesn't have borders. If the India, let's say, uh, goes to use coal, India and Bangladesh, as they're now doing, to use coal to, over, to carry forward their development, the rich countries, the ones who destroyed them for centuries, are going to suffer because the climate will heat to the point where they'll all be destroyed. But the gap, the grim gap is so enormous that the rich in the rich countries cannot act to provide the means to the poor in the poor countries to move on to solar energy and to wind power and to hydropower which they're very well equipped to do. I mentioned Egypt because we happen to be meeting in Egypt. Egypt could be providing Europe with the bulk of its energy, alleviating the energy crisis that is now extremely severe in Europe. As I said, pilot projects have already been set up, some of them at MIT, my own university which are quite promising, not being implemented. Uh, Saudi Arabia is digging up oil in the Northeast in order to destroy the world. 
you know what the sun is like in Saudi Arabia. They could be empowering the world with solar power. Uh, the rich could be providing the technology to the poor countries to move very quickly to sustainable energy. They're latecomers, but that gives them an advantage, just as it did with uh, communications. So the poor countries could move right on to cell phones without going through a hundred years of laying wire, telegraph wires and everything that the rich countries went through. Being behind in some way gives advantages. You can skip all the preparatory steps. Same is true in uh, with regard to fossil fuels. Instead of laying pipelines uh, and digging stuff out of the ground to poison you, you can move right on to sustainable energy, which is ample in most of the poor countries of the world. Sahara, lots of South Asia, uh, but that requires help from the rich countries, the rich and the rich countries. They won't do it. They won't do it even to save themselves. You'll notice that this is very similar to what we just witnessed in the COVID pandemic, like global warming, the pandemic has no borders. Uh, the rich in the rich countries monopolize the vaccines for themselves. They didn't provide them. There was theoretically an international pro program to provide them to the poor countries, barely funded, barely implemented. What that means is the poor countries were a, an arena in which the in which the virus could mutate quickly and freely, create variants that maybe can't, can't be controlled, that might kill everybody in the rich countries. Doesn't matter. The biomaxim is so extreme in our institutional structures that the need for short-term profit overwhelmed the need to save ourselves from possible uncontrollable uh, virus infection. Tells you a lot about the grim gap and about the nature of the institutions that we've created. Well, that's a long answer, but there's a lot of things there to think about. Okay, we have another question, uh, Professor Chomsky, on behalf of the faculty. Dr. Reem Basuni, who is a linguist and a novelist, asked the following question. I'll read it. Professor Chomsky, your trajectory is divided between the field of linguistics and related academic disciplines and your commitment to a vi livable and fair world. Do you see any intersection between your academic and public endeavors? There is a new trend in linguistics that attempts to identify inequality and strives to amend it. How do you think humanities in general and theoretical linguistics in particular can help us highlight our common humanity in the political world of today? I've often been asked that question. The first time I can remember was about 50 years ago or more. I was asked to write an article on uh, language and freedom and thought about it and started the article by saying a lot of things to say about language, a lot of things to say about freedom, but I'm having trouble with the word and. How can they be connected? Well, at a superficial level, they can't. There's no logical connection between having certain views on the nature of language and having similar views, certain views on freedom. They could vary. But if you penetrate deeper, there is actually a connection. And it's a connection that had been drawn in the past. <clears throat> 
during the Enlightenment, in fact, by people like Wilhelm von Humboldt, one of the founders of classical liberalism, founder of the modern research university, a leading figure of classical liberalism in the Enlightenment. He, he was one of several who pointed out that a core property of human beings is what has sometimes been called an instinct for freedom, shows itself in the social and political world in the constant effort of poor, repressed people to struggle for their freedom, something that Rousseau for one described eloquently. It also shows in another domain, in the domain of our unique properties of creative intelligence. Humans are a very strange species, very recent arrival on earth, nothing remotely like us. That's why we're having this meeting and uh, chimpanzees, our nearest relatives aren't. Uh, the core of these distinctive capacities are language and thought, which are intimately interconnected, perhaps identical, has been thought for millennia. And the essential property of thought was recognized early in the Enlightenment, early in the scientific revolution by Galileo, Descartes, their contemporaries. They regarded with awe and amazement the miraculous ability of humans with just a few symbols to construct in their minds infinitely many thoughts and even to use some of these thoughts to convey to others who have no access to our minds their innermost workings. They regarded this as one of the great miracles of the world, and it is. Galileo himself uh, regarded the alphabet as the most spectacular human invention, comparable to the works of a Michelangelo or a Titian, uh, because it was able to implement this astonishing capacity. Well, this is this creative capacity to constantly create new thoughts is the core of our ability to inquire, to create, to reflect, to examine, to think, uh, to pose questions, sometimes to answer them, maybe even to answer the grim question that I mentioned. At that level, there's a connection between language and freedom. It's language and the thought that's indistinguishable from it that offers us the possibility to move on to imagine a new free world, a more free world, and then to move on to create it. So there's a deep connection. The word and does have some force, but it's, it's at a deep level, not at the surface level. Thank you. This is the third question and the last one. And on behalf of AUC student, Ms. Nadia Faisal Siam, a graduate student in the Department of English and Comparative Literature, who is herself half Palestinian and half Ukrainian, asked the following question. Edward Said was interested in exploring a livable world for Palestinians. After a long engagement, with the question of Palestine, he concluded in favor of a one state solution with equal rights for all citizens, independent of their religion or ethnicity. Others argue for two separate states, a Jewish and a Palestinian. The Palestinian Authority stood for the latter and signed the Oslo Accords as a first step towards creating two states. Between 1993, when Oslo Accords were signed, and 2022, 
Israel has continuously violated the legal agreements and human rights codes. Israel continues expanding over the West Bank with its settlements and building its apartheid wall, among many other violations. In light of this, what would be a livable solution for Palestine and Palestinians today? And what strategies could be adopted to implement it? Well, as I mentioned at the outset, uh, Edward was a very close friend. Uh, we often discuss these questions. We met uh, about 50 years ago, uh, going 50, not 15, as the transcription says. Uh, the, uh, um, in my own history, this was an old story. Uh, back in the 1940s, I was what was then called a Zionist activist, strongly opposed to a Jewish state, working to try to, this is pre-1948, uh, working to try to create a Palestinian community based on Arab-Jewish cooperation, working class cooperation to create a socialist Palestine based on cooperative institutions. This may sound exotic today, but it was not at the time. It's been kind of suppressed from history, but in the aftermath of the depression and the great world war, there was an enormous wave of radical democracy around the world, many places seeking a much better future. One of the earliest post-war projects of the Allies, the victorious states, even before the war ended, was to try to repress this and beat it back. It's a long story, there's no time for it. But at the time, this was pretty normal. And in fact, it was part of Zionism. The Zionist movement was not formally committed to a Jewish state till 1942 at a meeting in the United States, first meeting in the United States. But this was still a very live topic up until the UN resolution of partition and the creation of Israel. So yes, I've long been in favor of a one state, if you want to call it that settlement. And in my own view, that doesn't go far enough. I think nobody wants to go back to the Ottoman Empire with its repression and violence, but they had some things right. Under the Ottoman Empire, you could go from Cairo to Baghdad to Constantinople without crossing a border, didn't need visas. It was a region with local autonomy, even within a small area. The Greeks could run their affairs, the Armenians could run their affairs, and so on. Well, there's a lot of sense to that. I mentioned the artificial Mexico border near Wolf. There's another artificial border, the Lebanon-Israel border, totally artificial. Actually, I saw that myself in the early 50s, when for a time I was living on a kibbutz in northern Israel. Like a lot of young kids, I was going backpacking. So I backpacked in the northern Galilee. I was hiking. And while I was hiking one evening, a jeep came along and a dirt road behind me. A guy got out of the jeep and started yelling at me in Hebrew, saying, come back, you're in the wrong country. I had walked into Lebanon. That was my first visit to Lebanon. There was no border then. There is no border. There shouldn't be a border. So one state is by no means enough. What there should be is an integration of the entire region into a cooperative uh, arrangement. That's not an idle dream. 
take a look at Europe. And for Europe, for centuries, Europe was the most savage place in the world. The Europeans' highest goal in life was to slaughter each other. Uh, 17th century, uh, uh, 30 years war, religious war, uh, about a third of the population of Germany was wiped out, went on and its horrors into the mid 20th century. Today, France and Germany are allies. You can cross from one country to the other, not needing a visa. Things can change. Well, the right answer, I thought, back in the early 40s was what I just described. Cooperative Arab-Jewish Palestinian community within a broader framework of integrated societies. I've never stopped thinking that. I still think that. However, it's one thing to think what I'd like. It's another thing to think, what can I do? What can I do to make things better in this world, not the world that I'm imagining? And it's here that I departed from my friend Edward in his latter days. Yes, it's nice to think about one state. It's even nicer to think about no states, a broader cooperative community, but we live in this world. And in this world, the fact of the matter, like it or not, is that if there is going to be one state, it'll be South Africa. There is no chance in this world, none, that Israel will say, okay, we go out of existence happily, uh, we become a minority, Jews become minority in a Palestinian state. That's the one state settlement. Anybody who wants that is consigning Palestinians to misery and destruction for the simple reason that there is no way that it's going to be implemented. I mean, there's no international support for it, even in the African states that support Palestinians where they're very jealous of sovereignty. But if there ever were any support, Israel would surely use its ultimate weapons to stop it and we'd all be finished. So it's nice to talk about, it's not gonna happen. What could happen, and this is more realistic, is agreement to maintain the apartheid state, but to struggle for civil rights within it. That could happen, maybe. My own feeling is that the two-state alternative is a preferable one to that, but those are the choices. When we, if you look at the discussion and debate about this topic, you find that it poses two options, a one-state settlement or a two-state settlement. It's a completely wrong framework. There's a third option, the one that is in fact being implemented and has in fact been systematically implemented since 1969, right after the 67 war. Israel has been systematically moving to implement policies that were pretty carefully laid out. The early stages, they were called the Alon Plan after Eagle Alon and given other names. Uh, they continued after the Oslo Agreement, which basically made no difference. Uh, the, uh, we could talk about Oslo, but I'll put it aside. The project has been to systematically create a greater Israel in which Israel will take over everything in the occupied territories and the Syrian Golan Heights, everything that's of value to it. Uh, that means the Jordan Valley, third of the arable land in the West Bank, greater Jerusalem, five times as large as Jerusalem ever was, including former Palestinian towns and villages, uh, uh, 
major settlements deep inside the West Bank, like Mala Dumim, Ariel Dumim, uh, others, uh, highways connecting them, uh, bisecting what's left of Palestine, uh, avoiding, avoiding the centers of population concentration. So Israel doesn't want Nablus, doesn't want Tulkar, uh, too many non-Jews. You want to create a greater Israel, a larger Jewish majority, great infrastructure programs, uh, development, connecting all of these things. So you can travel from your subsidized villa in Mala Dumim to your job in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv and not even though there's an Arab anywhere. In fact, in Israel now, the green line's been eliminated. Young people don't even know it exists. Uh, you might have read a couple of weeks ago that there was a hassle in Tel Aviv because the municipality wanted to post maps that mentioned the green line. Huge hassle. They were forced to back down. That suppressed doesn't exist. The idea is a greater Israel. Now, that's the option that is being implemented. You can talk about one state, you can talk about two states, but to have the debate and discussion without looking at the live option that is being systematically implemented day by day. Today it's Masafer Yata, tomorrow it'll be somewhere else, uh, but constant, well-planned, well-understood, uh, the so-called doves are right in the front. Shimon Peres was in the lead in establishing settlements deep inside what Israel calls Judea and Samaria, settlements near Nablus. Yitzhak Rabin, after Oslo, announced clearly, we're going to extend and expand rings of settlement. We continue with our project. Uh, Shimon Peres, the great peacekeeper in his uh, last uh, his last press conference, 1996, before he handed over power, uh, he said straight out, there will never be an independent Palestinian state. Actually, believe it or not, the first administration to accept the possibility of a Palestinian state was Netanyahu. When Netanyahu came into office in 1996, his Minister of Information in a press conference was asked, can there ever be a Palestinian state? And he answered, we don't intend to take everything. We're just going to take what we want. And there'll be something left for the Palestinians. And if they want to call it a state, OK or they can call it fried chicken. That was the first recognition of a Palestinian state uh, by Israel. Nothing much changes except for rhetoric. And meanwhile, while greater Israel is being established, uh, the scattered Palestinians will be left in the areas that Israel will take over or segregated into, I think it's by now, about 170 or so small uh, settlements surrounded by Israeli soldiers and they will occasionally let them go out and tend their fields or pick their olives if the settlers haven't gotten there first. Uh, that's the live option. can talk about the others. Of the others, my own feeling is the least bad and probably the most feasible is some kind of two-state settlement, maybe along the lines of, uh, say, the Geneva proposals of 2003, not official, but high-level negotiations blocked by the United States and Israel. I don't think that's totally impossible for one reason, important reason. There's an important shift of public opinion in the United States, dramatic, in fact. Uh, 10 or 20 years ago, 
if I was giving a talk on these topics at a university, even my own university, I had to have police protection. Meetings were broken up uh, violently. Uh, uh, they had to have airport security at meetings because of the threat of bombs and terror. Uh, that's ended. It ended dramatically in the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, support for Palestinians far exceeds support for Israel in the university settings. If you look at polls, it's the same. Actually, the big turning point here, pretty sharp, was cast, Operation Cast Lead. That just broke the dam, it was too much. And you could see a very sharp change at that point. Well, this has changed substantially. Uh, you go back 10 or 20 years, uh, the base for support for Israel in the United States was among liberal Democrats, not any longer. They're now support more supportive of Palestinian rights than of Israel. I think that'll probably extend further after yesterday's election. Uh, if you haven't done so, I'd urge you to read the lead editorial today in Haaretz, Israel's leading newspaper about the election, captures very well what's happening. And that'll have an effect in the United States as it has before. The base for the support for Israel in the United States is now in Christian evangelicals who are deeply anti-Semitic. They think all Jews are gonna to go to permanent damnation, but they want to accelerate it by supporting Israel and leading to a conflict and all of this business I won't go into. That's the main base of support, along with the security services. Israel's, of course, comparative advantages in means of violence, security, surveillance, so tightly connected to US military security service, US ultranationalists, uh, the right wing of the Republican Party is the base for support. That can have an effect in change of policy, and you're already beginning to see the signs of it. For the first time ever, there is legislation proposed in Congress, doesn't get passed, but it's being proposed to reconsider all aid to Israel, which happens to violate US law, bring up the provisions of US law, which prevent aid to countries which, where the military units are engaged in systematic human rights violations, or which are violating the non-proliferation treaty and other treaties concerning nuclear weapons. You couldn't say a word about this recent, till very recently. Now you can not only talk about it, but it's actually reaching the halls of Congress. It's a very thing you can commonly talk about in university settings, other settings where you get young people. Well, can lead to changes. May seem surprising, but if you think about changes that have taken place in the past, much greater ones, it's not out of the question. That's my own feeling about where the hope lies for steps towards a far better world, which will observe, recognize Palestinian national rights and may move to the kind of ideal of a cooperative Palestine within a regional uh, 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 settlement that uh, you could think about seriously uh, 80 years ago. So. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chomsky, for your time and your insights. Thank you, the audience. I'm sorry we can't have more time and more questions. I'm sure you're anxious to extend the conversation with Professor Chomsky, but we have to give him time to relax and rest. Thank you, the IT team of AUC. You have done great work and we appreciate it. And we'll meet you again in the next Edward Said uh, Memorial Lecture. Bye-bye.